Trigger warning, Death and Friends is not a podcast for the light of heart. Many dark and serious subjects will come up. Listener discretion is advised. In case it wasn't obvious already from the title of this episode or from the last few hundred years of history, this one is going to be a huge bummer. But it's an important one, especially now. This is a comedy podcast, but it's also a history one. While we try to make history, even the shitty parts, feel a little bit more uh, b- 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 lighthearted, we'll say, uh, sometimes that's not always a choice because some of that history is real shitty. We're going to try today to make sense of this mess on a seriously misguided holiday. So much of Native history has been washed away or rewritten without agency. But the more we try and make history palatable, the more we bury the horrors that we can and do afflict on each other. And so, Skeleton Army, happy Thanksgiving. We hope it's a time for you to enjoy your family and friends and eat until you tip the scales in directions you only dreamed of. And today we make you one promise. We'll eventually get better at our jobs. Probably. And together, we can make America worse. And if in the meantime, tomorrow, you happen to alienate a conservative relative or two by doing some, you know, some fact checking that isn't on Facebook or Meta, whatever the hell it's called, we're also very down with that too. Tell them Nash and Angel say hey, and also go fuck yourself. And then they'll be like, who are Nash and Angel? But you know. You know. You know. Welcome back, Skeleton Army. I'm Angel, and this lovely ball of spite is Nash. Hello. Oh, you want me to do it like, hello? (laughs) Yes, that's exactly what I wanted. (laughs) I'm Robin Williams now. As promised, here's the episode where we ruin Thanksgiving. Nash, go forth and paint the picture. Cracking knuckles. It's November 1620, and we're in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Here's an early fun fact for you. Plymouth, Massachusetts is my hometown. Fun fact in Ash. How do you like that? Sounds about white. Zing! Please, someone, update my Wikipedia page post-haste. Okay, let's talk real briefly about how we got here. Gestures at bullshit. Hey, buddy, you don't have to read the stage directions. Also, you don't have to write them either. Angel, please. Daddy is working. Okay, yeah. The daddy hit real nice. <laughs> it really did. You nailed it. We've talked about Puritanism before, and if you don't remember, pop on over to the Salem Witch Trial episode for a deeper dive on that. But for today, all you really need to know about them is that they, along with a group of non-Puritan folks called Separatists, who do not like the Church of England, come to New England to bask in the glow of freedom of religion. And also the word new. Yeah, definitely the word new. Mm. Wait wait to hear about Mexico. You say freedom of religion, but really, they just want to be free of the Church of England, specifically. One thing white people hate is being told what they can or can't do, especially when it's being told to them from other white people. Rules are hard when you believe you are inherently special and exempt from all rules. The white people house words. May that rain be fucking over. Amen. CVS beggars. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah, dog. So a bunch of those people commission a little boat they call the Mayflower. That boat tries to leave England in late spring with its sister ship, the Speedwell. But the Speedwell tries to sink a bunch of times and then they turn back. In fun news, it's been theorized that the crew of the Speedwell intentionally made the boat leaky by time number three so they didn't have to go on this pointlessly dangerous mission across the Atlantic in a boat that was sort of in rough shape. Hashtag Team Speedwell crew. Get it, guys. Hashtag True Icons. They cram 102 pilgrims and about 30 crewmen into the Mayflower, and they leave for America in early September. The first half of the voyage is pretty good, all things considered, and the second half of the voyage is very bad, which I guess is less good. It's the 17th century, so bets on how many of those people die on board? Anybody taking bets? Taking bets? Mm -hmm. I wanted this to be a fun fact, but I need that for later. So here's a free one. They leave England with 102 passengers, and they arrive stateside 
with 102 passengers. Hot damn. What luck, everybody. <laughs> Looks like the house wins again. All right, Steve, Steve, you stay right there, you son of a bitch. You still owe me back from the Aztec episode. Here's the neat bit. They lose their physician overboard during a storm, so he dies. But then a baby is born, like mid-Atlantic, so that number stays 102. Boom, babies. <laughs> Uh, I love that they just lost one guy and the guy happened to be the doctor that they probably like super needed. Yeah, he probably would have oh, been. Oh, God. Where's Steve? <laughs> Bye, Meanwhile, Steve. Meanwhile, Steve is just like, help. <laughs> floating away. They're shouting, can you help us deliver the baby? As he's like, just out of sight. Gone forever. Lost to the sea. Steve. <sighs> All right. So now that Steve's <laughs> We just had a moment of silence for this fake doctor. <laughs> yeah, he could have been mildly useful. So they're shooting for Virginia, but they sort of make a cock up of that. And they land outside Cape Cod. It's November. They're hungry, freezing, and I assume pretty much being over being on a boat at that point. So they go ashore and they quickly set up shop. And by shop, we mean they come onto the land, explore a bit, maybe, I don't know, open up a few native graves, maybe rebury them, maybe take a few things, and maybe release some karmic forces slash ghosts that ultimately get their revenge. And then they build a fort. A haunted fort. And then a bunch of them start to die from exposure, overwork. But this story isn't about them. No. Allow me to introduce the people that the white people were grave robbing from. Enter the Wampanoag tribe. In the early 17th century, the tribe consisted of 67 villages with a population between 25,000 and 40,000. Apropos of nothing, in case you were, I don't know, trying to keep score, the native people in this part of the world, of whom the Wampanoag are descended, have lived in the New England area for 15,000 years. Just giving you that information. What a strange fact to give for zero reasons. You know, just to a native fact like this, this current timeline. With all the people who love and cherish and learn from historical facts. Did, did, you, did you want to hear that fact again? Maybe the one I gave you for no reason. Well, if you did want to hear it again, here it is again. The native people of New England have lived here for 15,000 years. Okay, there you go. Free. Right. Free fact that you now know. So great. Yeah. And now that you heard that piece of good old information more than one time, uh, there's also this little piece of, just a little, wee baby, a little, little baby piece of information that you might want to know. The Wampanoag tribe still very much exists. Just more fun facts for you to have for free for no reason. Unfortunately, it's time to let you know that in the summer of 1616, a pandemic swept through New England and killed anywhere between one third and 90% of the inhabitants. Oof, that was, in fact, not fun. Oh, you're correct. Do you need a fun one? Yeah, yeah, I sort of do. Got you, bud. The summer of 1616 was also a cicada year. <sighs> That's, um, it's, I mean, it's a fact. Yeah. Definitely a thing that happened. Yep. Not that fun, gonna be honest. Ah, well, sorry. There's not a ton of fun shit happening right now anyway, and I'm pretty sure it's about to get worse. What are you talking about? Black death, polio, spontaneous combustion. Dying comes in after death. Comes decomposition. It may seem sad and also gross, but here you are, and here's your host, not an actual doctor, but it's medical, medical, medical facts with Doctor Angel. Oh, oh no! Oh no no no! Oh, man. Okay. All right. Okay, look, look. We don't really know what the natives were dying of during this pandemic. We do know from primary sources on both the native side and from the just visiting white people that there were a few key markers, severe bloody noses, jaundice, and that did not seem to affect those visiting white people. Notice. All that bad stuff happened, and then didn't affect them. Historians have made a few guesses, largely smallpox, the bubonic plague, influenza, and more recently, leptospirosis, also called 
Whale's disease. Whale's disease? W-E-I-L's disease. It is spread from bacteria from affected animal urine and soil. If you contract it and you don't get antibiotics, you die from liver or kidney failure. Basically, all the bad juju your body normally processes through, those organs actually built up. And then you poison your own body to death. We will never know for sure what disease was killing in 1616, since, like most other diseases, thankfully, it dies with the host. And paleomicrobiology is a relatively new science that hopefully does not have its eyes on a Jurassic Park-like relationship with its history. If you're a paleomicrobiologist and for some reason you're listening to this podcast, please keep a close eye on your colleagues. Dear God, do it. Any sign that they're going to go full Dr. John Hammond, give us a heads up. Life does not need to uh, uh, find a way. Happy Thanksgiving. To continue on the trend of being a huge goddamn bummer, that epidemic lasted for years until 1618. And a case a 90% mortality rate hasn't terrified you to your core. Here's Thomas Morton, one of those visiting white guys. Uh, the hand of God fell heavily upon them. It was such a mortal stroke that they died on heaps as they lay in their houses. We may not know what was killing them, but one of the cooler... Okay, Nash. So cool. So cool. 90% death rates. Okay. Okay. Not cool, uh, but uh, historically relevant. Okay. A little better. Maybe better. Not really. Anyway, one of the reasons studying Deathways archaeology is so important is that even though bodies can't always tell us about disease, they can tell us a lot about the conditions of a society just by how one burial differs from another, and how those burials changing over time can tell us about cultural changes or contacts with other cultures. Wow. That's, that's so neat, Nash. It's so cool. Right? Right? <laughs> So what the deathways in 1616 to 1618 New England tell us is a complete breakdown of those deathways. Bodies go completely unburied, and native tribes at the time had rather elaborate, detailed burials, which have a lot of significance. Grave goods are important to honor the deceased, and the body's position and orientation in the grave are also important, and we see none of that during this time. And when you're talking about a 90% mortality rate, there's no time and no healthy people to do any of those rituals. So any way you look at it, you've got an entire culture in crisis. And it's important to remember for the rest of this history because it gets mirrored pretty neatly on the colonist side of things. And both sides having this very specific experience leads directly to Thanksgiving. In case it wasn't super obvious to you from that actual monologue, Nash is kind of passionate about burials. That wasn't even that bad. I could have gone on for several more hours. Holy shit. Okay. <clears throat> We've been generalizing a bit across New England, which didn't just have the Wampanoag tribe, by the way. There were dozens of others. But for today's topic, we are focusing on the Wampanoag people in the village known as Patuxet, which would become modern day Plymouth. Now, the colonists arriving in 1620 had no way of knowing the conditions of the natives. I mean, they could have, like, asked. I guess. Hello, fellow humans, what's up? We're just chilling over here, wondering if that's cool, how you guys been? Oh man, a plague, that sucks, look, we're not doing so hot either, hey. So, uh, we showed up here, without asking, so we probably deserve it, am I right? <laughs> anyway, give me all your food. They'd spent months on a boat, and they landed in relatively unknown territory in the middle of winter. They knew the natives were nearby, but they had no knowledge of the epidemic or how it affected the Wampanoags, so they assumed two things. They were being watched, and they could not show themselves to be easy prey. They scramble to get things set up and ready for 102 people to live there, but they are fighting exposure and sickness, and also largely being a population that was not super used to struggling for food or shelter. In desperation, they do a bit of mild grave disturbing. It goes over as well as you'd expect. It's one of those horror movies where you know from that moment that everyone's going to die and you're just kind of like, you know what? Fine. Fine. Okay. Yes, I accept. Mm -hmm. No one is hot enough to be that much of a dick. You heard it here, tens. Not even you can desecrate graves and still be likable. Okay. So nothing actually happens to them about that particular grave robbing in terms of the Wampanoags getting revenge or anything. Okay, tens. I guess maybe you're fine. But their winter does begin to suck haunted balls pretty quickly after that. About 50% of them die before spring. Food is tough, they're weak and scared. At a few points, William Bradford, who would become the governor of Plymouth in a manner of months, dun, 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 writes in his journal that there were times that only six or so people were healthy enough to actually do work. 
Others, some of them dying, were propped up near the outskirts holding guns. <laughs> oh. Just. Oh, so the settlement seemed like it was being guarded. Oh, no. Oh, man. That... <laughs> Honestly, I'd be so pissed if I was dying and I still had to go to work. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, bud, go ahead and cough it out. Uh, wow, that's a lot of blood. Oh, that can't be good. Uh, sit up a bit. Here's your gun. Yep, just right there. Like you're just going to shoot and, hey, oops, hey, <laughs> do me a favor. Try not to keep coughing, okay? All right, we got a reputation to maintain. Put that gun out of your mouth. <laughs> just them trying to be like, please, <laughs> let me die. Meanwhile, the other guy's building camp and they're writing home, like, trying to stay positive. Yeah, yeah, things at home are <laughs> harder than we, th we thought. Lots of us are dead now, but no worries. The natives still think we're scary. Maybe. Gobble, gobble. The Puritan settlers were pretty big bummers about ritual and displays of grandeur and that they didn't want any. But, probably, they wanted at least, like, one grave per person. Yeah, but they start to die too fast for all that. At least, that's what it looks like. Fun facts with Nash. If you've ever been to Plymouth, Massachusetts, one, I'm sorry, and B, you've stood on a mass grave. Coles Hill is a pretty serious slope directly across from the Plymouth Rock. Heavy quotations here because the rocks fake. I told you not to tell anyone. <sighs> anyway, it's fake. <laughs> Coles Hill gets its name from its second owner, James Cole, who runs a tavern on the spot in the 1630s and 40s, but it's the location of the first settlement and burying ground of the Puritans, until 1637 when they create Burial Hill, which is the first cemetery. We aren't totally sure of how many people got buried there, or even who, really, besides the list of deaths recorded, but we do know there are bones there, and we've discovered that in the most metal way possible. Boneland slides. Bone. Bone landslides. Bone landslides, baby. Who says history isn't fun? Just would like to point out that yes, a bunch of dead people are Nash's literal definition of fun. I'll let that sink in. Okay, continue. A series of bad rainstorms over the years, particularly in the late 19th century, led to massive mudslides on Coles Hill which is rather steep as far as hills are concerned, if they're concerned about anything. It results in landslides, which contains bones from several different skeletons. Here's a guy called John Goodwin writing in 1879. <clears throat> in a storm of 1735, a torrent pouring down Middle Street made a ravine in Coles Hill and washed many human remains down into the harbor. In 1809, a skull with especially fine teeth was exposed. In 1855, these graves were exposed in the lame public conduit on Coles Hill. In one grave lay two skeletons, pronounced by surgeons, male and female. The man had a particularly noble forehead, and it was finally surmised that here were the remains of Mr. and Mrs. Carver. These found a new grave on Burial Hill, but other relics with barbaric taste were placed on top of the stone canopy over Forefather's Rock. Thanks, buddy. We didn't have to include that quote, but to be honest with you, it's actually low-key one of the most accidentally funny things I've ever read. This man has the weirdest opinions and use of adjectives. He was like, well, hey, that's a skull, but damn, look at that fine-ass teeth. What a noble forehead you got. That's a nice forehead. Jesus. I'm literally weeping right now. It's beautiful. Anyway, to answer the question that no one asks, we know they aren't native burials because the burials contained no grave goods and the skeletons were, before they took a very Fleetwood Mac trip to the public eye, buried with their feet facing east. Indigenous burials, as we've already noticed, because our dudes have done some plundering already in the story, contained grave goods and bodies that were often laid to rest on their right side in the fetal position, with their head facing southwest towards the land of souls. To answer the other question no one asked, many of the skeletons or disarticulated remains unearthed at Coles Hill were reburied together under a monument dedicated to them. Imagine hating someone you die near, and then you get buried in an undisclosed mass grave with them. And then you're finally freed from the rainstorm, only from them, to rebury you in the same goddamn pit! Out of respect! One of those classic angry ghost piles. <sighs> do ghosts come in piles? To be honest, what else are you supposed to do? 
It's like, I got 75% of a dude over here, half a lady's hip and femur, and three-fifths of someone else's rib cage. Kind of just got to make skeletal soup at that point. Hope nobody's soul follows you home. Not now, ghosts. Stop it. We got to get back to business. Thanksgiving as a celebration meal was a thing long before the holiday that got its name. In fact, Thanksgivings were often held after a Sabbath, harvest, and other good tidings. And also success in killing people. You know, just the good vibe days. Solid vibes. So it's late winter, 1621. The colonists are weak and tired and fucking cold as shit, probably. And stupid hungry. Like starving. Literally. Very literally, actually. Not even, that's not even a bit. They're actually dying. Yes, literally. The Wampanoag are still pretty weakened from the earlier epidemic. They're surrounded by enemy tribes, including the Massachusetts to the north near Boston, and the threat of war is looming. They have a few pretty shit choices. Wait around to be attacked, flee, or risk exposing themselves to the new settlers' potential viruses and try to get access to their weapons and goods. Ultimately, the Puritans run into a native man called Squanto. They were both just like running errands in the line at the bank. You know, Squanto, is that you, bud? How random. Oh my God, Squanto, what's up, baby boy? What's happening again? What's you doing? <laughs> oh, what? What's that? She's pregnant? <laughs> Who's baby? Nice. Squanto is a Wampanoag who had previously been captured by Englishmen and brought to England as a slave. So he's had a journey. He escapes and then makes it his home, though, but not before he becomes fluent in English. Which is a very shitty way to learn a language. There's a joke about Duolingo in here somewhere, but it's probably horrible. So Squanto helps the Puritans and the Wampanoag Nation get to a peace treaty, which is signed by Puritan leadership. Insert white guy name here. John Carver. There it is. And the Wampanoag sage of Massasoit in March 1620. In return for fighting each other's enemies, the Native Americans also get access to European goods, which they could trade or use as burial goods. And the colonists get a serious education on how to grow crops. And eat them. How to eat food for dummies. First edition. Step one. Stop taking food out of graves. It's weird and gross and super disrespectful. <laughs> uh. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. <laughs> In late fall, the pilgrims decide to have a Thanksgiving for their bountiful first harvest. In the new world. They have a ton of food. The Mayflower was on its way back to New England with probably some new, worse, pilgrims. And they're just vibing. You know, they're having a good time. According to their records, they, via Squanto, invite Massasoit and his people over for a three-day festival. But according to the oral history of the Wampanoag people, they're alerted to the sounds of gunfire at the pilgrim site. And they arrive thinking they're about to go to war to protect their new alliance. When they get there, the colonists explain that the gunfire is traditionally in celebration of their Thanksgiving. The Wampanoag people decide to stay a while to make sure the pilgrims aren't lying or betraying them, and eventually they just get taken into the celebrations by the virtue of being physically close to them. Well, that's uh, quite a spectrum there. Mm -hmm. uh, gee, I wonder, he said out loud, yeah. which side, you know, might mm. be exaggerating to make themselves look better. Histories, mysteries. The Colonizer series. We'd like to just point out that this is the pilgrims throwing a huge-ass party to celebrate being alive. And it gets the attention of the nearby tribe who were not invited, but who are directly responsible for the pilgrims being alive. We'd also like to point out, if you're just picturing this whole thing in your head, when we say huge-ass party, we mean the remaining alive people. Of which there are like 40. This is basically the pilgrim answer to Fire Festival. Yeah, it, it would be Firefest if they opened Fire Festival with desk pops and everyone just casually treated burials like a vending machine. Bra, bra. Something, something sucking dick for water. Although I guess if they did suck dick for water, it probably would have been a better treaty. Yeah, honestly, they, they better have, honestly. So it's not the easiest piece. Yeah. Both sides are too weak to fight each other, but both have serious concerns about each other's loyalty. And the bad news is that the Puritans were pretty, pretty, Dear soon after they were not, hmm, not so trustworthy. No, no. It's no bueno. And then they'd prove it a bunch more times in increasingly horrifying ways, repeatedly and basically indefinitely. In the 1630s, after a suspected killing, quotation marks, this is definitely in quotes, uh, of a white man by a neighboring tribe called the Pequot, who were mostly in Connecticut, 
The pilgrims burn some tribal homes to the ground and murder anyone they find, regardless of tribe affiliation, and then declare Thanksgiving as a celebration of the survival of their own people, calling it a, quote, bloody victory. Ah, a victory over decency and judicial systems and human rights, apparently. Overall, great job, team. Super fantastic. Great work, guys. Just great work. Oh, Jeff Bud Dip. What is this? A block of Velveeta? Oh, the best. Thanksgiving wouldn't become a celebrated holiday as we know it, you know, this happy meal with your family, which theoretically represents the first time white people played nice with, uh, let me check here, literally anyone until someone later on, which given what they were calling Thanksgiving in 1630, uh, low-key a surprise. George Washington, in his first term as president, announced the Thanksgiving in the autumn to cover all the victories the nation had earned during the year. Because prior to that announcement, they had Thanksgivings every single goddamn time they won anything. George is like, look, we are the DJ Khaled of winning things right now. And I do not have time for this shit. I've got to sit here and feel real smug in the direction of England. DJ Khaled, we the best. Later, Thanksgivings were sort of up to any church or parish or town. Is there deemed to be a religious holiday? Because that's what Jesus did. Yeah. He ate turkey. And thereby, not really relevant to the state. Because, and I'm not sure anybody here remembers this shit, but there was a whole thing about church and state, well, being separate. Like, not connected. Not even looking at each other. No. At all. Mm Mm-hmm. It's good old Abraham Lincoln that gives us the connection between modern Thanksgiving and the Pilgrims' sort of secret party meal. The United States of America is at war with itself, and the two sides seem dedicated in their opposition and hatred of the other. So many dead, so many more to die. What can we do? Oh wait, yes, perfect. A meal. It will solve everything. Lincoln makes it an official American holiday in 1863, but it's not until after the Civil War, into the late 19th century, that the holiday harkens back to the Pilgrims and the Wampanoag, mostly because at that point, everyone had forgotten that they hated Native people. Right, because for the most part, they'd been completely eradicated from both land and history. They were like, Native people never heard of them. To make matters worse, or at least continually as shitty... The center of this holiday, the turkey, is directly descended from our good buddy and favorite weekly visitor to this podcast. You guessed it. Here he is. Yay. It's racism. No hats in the house. (sighs) The turkey, in the years between 1621 and basically all the rest of them, becomes a symbol of a generic Indian person. Not even tribally specific, just generically. Wait, seriously? Yeah. And... Yeah. Well, okay. And when it comes to incorporating the natives back into the holiday narrative, white people just go with what they know best. Racism. Yay. In order to reunite a nation that just finished fighting over the right to own a person, they create a holiday about the last time they murdered another culture's life and livelihood. And they make sure that in case it wasn't obvious to the native people that they didn't give a fuck about them. They create a symbol of them as food and then made it the center of the meal. In the rewrite, the settlers get billed as God's chosen people who overcome incredible adversity and pull themselves up right by their bootstraps. And the natives who ensured those guys' survival got a footnote in a fake story about friendship and then get metaphorically eaten. And on that note, that's the episode. A special thanks to you, our favorite listener. Remember, subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. A rate and review would also be nice. Is it? Is it nice? Is that what it is? I guess we'll find out if they do it. Okay, great. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter. I'm at Gorilla Jokes. And I'm at It's Nash Flynn. And of course, follow the podcast at Death and Friends Podcast. Want to become an official member of the Skeleton Army? Do you? Uh, um, uh, yeah, I guess. Yes. Join us on Patreon. We use it to cover our sound guy's medical bills. In order to properly write medical facts, we expose Dom to all the illnesses and ways to die we talk about on the show. He did not have a good time uh, this episode specifically. No. Last one, he had a grand old time. Uh, You know, with the epidemic that we're not entirely sure what it is, we just kind of tried them all. Yeah, he, um, he doesn't look so good again. Spray some more Windex on him. 
So check it out at patreon.com slash death and friends. We got Alrighty. Hey, speaking of Patreon, let's give a shout out to our people at the Brendan Fraser level. Shout out to Andrea, Diane H, Luella B, Vicky R, happy birthday, Kevin L, Jonathan D, and Andy C. I like your hat, Andy. It's a nice hat. Solid hat. Nice. Well, special thanks to them. But hey, special thanks to you too, person listening. You good, egg you. I need you to remember something, all right? Death, it's tricky to talk about, especially in this episode. But we need you to remember something super important. You're loved. You matter. And if you don't want to be your own friend, we will happily be your friend. We can finally learn that friendship handshake. Until next time, Skeleton Army, stay spooky. Love you. Love you. This has been a Knavery Inc. podcast. Go to knaveryinc.com for more details. Executive produced by Jacob Duffy Halbleib. Audio design by Dominic Guanzon. Themes and transitions by Amy Doe. The fuck is a knave?